going to do a quick video here proving that Roman Catholics are not Bible-believing Christians. All right. Uh, in order for you to be a Christian, you would have to believe in this book and believe in what it teaches. And I find it kind of ironic that a lot of the Catholic positions and Catholic names and terminology don't appear anywhere in the pages of any Bible, Roman Catholic or Christian. All right. Uh, very interesting. But I'm actually going to play a little uh, video clip here from a Roman Catholic show called EWTN. This was Je June the 22nd of 2015. It's the host, and then uh, on the right there, it's a man named Dr. David Anders. All right. Listen to what the caller says. It's a call in talk show or whatever. Listen to what the caller says, and then listen to his response. All right. Saying that the Bible is not their final authority. Check this out. Okay, uh, thanks for taking the call. My sure. question is, I read the uh, St. Joseph's New American Bible through for the first time, and I didn't see anywhere, or because it's so difficult to read, I didn't see where it has anything about purgatory. Where would I find something that would reference purgatory? Okay, sure. Thank you very much. I appreciate the question. I'm going to answer the question, but I want to I want to raise a question myself about the premise, and that is, if it were the case, it's not the case, but if it were the case that the Catholic Church proposed to me a doctrine that I could not find explicitly in the text of sacred scripture, it would not follow that the doctrine was not part of the deposit of Christian faith. It would not follow that I didn't have a moral obligation to believe that doctrine. Because Christ told me that if I want to know the contents of Christian faith, I go first to the ecclesiastical tradition, I go to the teaching authority of the church, rather than to the text of Scripture. Okay. Christ told me that I go to the ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical teaching of the church rather than sacred Scripture. Uh, chapter and verse on that? Because, I mean, obviously Jesus Christ was not walking around the earth right now, so for Christ to tell him something, it would have to be recorded in the pages of Scripture, in the four gospel accounts, correct? I mean, I, you know, the, wouldn't that be just logical? Let's continue. Christ never said a word about reading the Bible. Whoa. Okay, Christ never said a word about reading the Bible. Really? Hmm, that's interesting. Well, I'm going to do something for you, if you're a Roman Catholic, that your priest will never ever do. I'm going to show you what the Bible says. Here we have the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Okay, these first five verses here are talking about the capital W Word of God. This is a reference to Jesus Christ, the manifest Word of God. There are seven references to the capital Word of God in the King James Bible. And of course, this Bible is forbidden from you reading it if you're a Roman Catholic. Uh, and let me just show you up here, Luke chapter 24, verse 45. It says, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. I thought this uh, Dr. Anders here just said Jesus never said to read the Bible. Uh, he opened their understanding so that they could understand the Scriptures. That's kind of an issue, issue isn't it? But I'm going to show you the difference between the capital W Word of God and the lowercase w written Word of God. First, we're going to go to John chapter 5, verse 24. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Heareth my word. Hmm. Interesting. Jump right over here to verse 39 of the same chapter. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jesus never said read the Bible. Oh, well, maybe not those exact words, read the Bible. What do you think search the scriptures means? <laughs> yeah, okay. Verses 46 through 47. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Jesus never said to uh, read the Bible. 
You say, well, it's, it's not talking about the written. It's talking about the manifest. Uh, wrote of me, writings. Uh, yes, it is talking about the written word of God. Let's go over to chapter 6 in the book of John. Chapter 6, verses 53 down through. This is a big thing for Roman Catholics, okay? This is about their little defense of their mass thing. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. Now see right there, this is what they'll say as defense of the unbloody, unbloody sacrifice of the Mass. He's talking about you know, the, the wine and the bread there. So it's, it's, Jesus is saying that it's his actual physical, you know, flesh and blood. Um, no, he's not. Let's keep reading. Verse 57, As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Look what Jesus is comparing it to. If you eat me, even he shall live by me. As, and I live by the Father. What's he saying there? Jesus, as he lives by the Father, we're supposed to live by Jesus. There's one mediator between God and man. That's the man Christ Jesus. It says back there in, uh, I think it's 1 Timothy. So wait a second. If we are supposed to eat the physical, literal flesh and blood of Jesus, then that means that Jesus had to eat the physical literal flesh and blood of God the Father, according to that passage, which, of course, is nonsense. You say, I'm not convinced. Okay, let's keep reading. Look down at verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Hmm. The flesh profiteth nothing. Even if you could make the wafer and the wine into the flesh and blood of Jesus, it would profit you nothing at all. Interesting. But your priest isn't going to tell you that. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Huh, the rest of the verse there. Isn't that interesting? Jesus never said to read the Bible. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It's kind of an issue there if you're a Roman Catholic. John 8, verses 31 and 32. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, written word there, see, lowercase w, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Did you ever hear that saying? How do you have this? By continuing in his, his word there, his written word. Jesus never said that you're supposed to read the Bible. <laughs> yeah, okay there, liar. My little note here, can't understand the King, the King James Version. Here's why. Here's what Jesus says to the Catholics of his day, the scribes and the Pharisees. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Perfect description of Roman Catholics. And this Dr. Andrews guy, or Anders, excuse me. Yeah, Anders. But let's finish what he says here. Listen to some of this stuff. Rather, he gave his teaching to the apostles and said, Go make disciples of all nations and teach them everything I have commanded you. And, of course, everything he commanded was oral tradition. And I will be with you to the end of the age. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Whoever hears you hears me. So it's sacred tradition delivered to us by Jesus, in, uh, interpreted and taught to us by the church. That's how we know the contents of Christian faith. That goes for the doctrine of purgatory and all the rest of it. Not all of Christian tradition is contained in sacred scripture. <sighs> Okay, stop there. Not all of tradition, tr Christian tradition is contained in sacred scripture. Oh, really? 
Well, if you're a Roman Catholic pagan, that's true. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, nope, sorry. Let's continue. But all of Christian tradition is binding on the conscience of the individual Christian. So I just want to make that point so you understand from the outset. Now, that being said, we do find the doctrine of purgatory in the Bible in the same way that we find doctrines like the Trinity in the Bible. We don't find the word purgatory in the Bible any more than we find the word Trinity in the Bible, but we find the, the, the substance of the thing there, and we can arrive at it by inference and implication. So I would look to a passage like 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verses 43 to 46. Okay, so he points out it, it is in the Bible, and then he goes to apocryphal books. Apocryphal books that were not ever part of the inspired text of Scripture. Books that were written after the Bible's completion. You say, oh no, that's not true. The Septuagint goes back. They were using that in Jesus' day. There's not one shred of proof for that. What happened with the Septuagint is later, when the Bible was finished, there were times when they were quoting, you know, just from memory or whatever else, and they would quote, New Testament writers would quote something from the Old Testament. And it doesn't always line up word for word to the Old Testament. And so what Origen, Adamentius Origen, did is he, I believe, was the one that wrote the, the Septuagint books. Um, he, or whatever scholar, it could have been somebody else, I don't know, and you know, because it came out, the, the oldest extant copies of the uh, Septuagint are in his Hexapla. Big study, but the point is, um, he was the one, or some other scholar, they looked at the quotations of Jesus and the disciples there in the Gospels, and then they wrote a Greek translation of the Old Testament and matched it to those words. And then they came out with this lie that, oh well, see, they had it there in the first century, and that's what they were that's why they were reading, you know, and it's read just like this. See, you know, there are no BC Septuagints. That's very important to understand. So this Maccabees thing is not part of inspired, you know, the inspired canon of scripture. Excuse me, scripture. Even Jerome said that. So, and that's why the King James Bible, when it first came out, it had the apocryphal books as uh, just historical for their historical value, but they put them between the Old Testament and the New Testament. They were not interspersed in with the inspired texts of Scripture. So they were there for their historical quality um, between the Old and the New Testament, but they were never part of the text. But if you have a Catholic Bible, like this is the 1610 uh, Dewey Reams, over here, four volumes of it, um, they have it. It's part of the text. Let's continue with this Catholic. Where we learn that the, the, uh, the Hebrews offered prayers on behalf of the dead, that those who died in questionable moral circumstances, uh, they were prayed for by the people of God and offered on their behalf. We, 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 we ask ourselves the question, why would the people of God pray on behalf of the dead? If the dead were in heaven, they would not have any need of our prayers. If the dead were in hell, they would not benefit from our prayers. Right. There must, therefore, be an intermediate state in which the dead can benefit from the prayers on earth. Um, uh, when, we, when we plug more deeply into the, into the theology of sacred scripture, we find also that the Bible distinguishes between the guilt of sin that is forgiven when we repent and the temporal punishment due to sin, what we might call a penance, that is imposed after the guilt has been forgiven. That also is a scriptural teaching that you can find in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and 2 Samuel 24. It's the way the church has always dealt with sin, forgiving and imposing a temporal penance. So the logic of purgatory comes into play when we realize that even though our sins are forgiven, sometimes we have a temporal penance to pay that is not satisfied in this life that can be satisfied in the state that we call purgatory, which we infer from passages like 2 Maccabees chapter 12. It's also important to remember that the doctrine of purgatory is implicit in the liturgical practice of the church from its earliest days, in that the church has always offered prayers on behalf of the dead and understood that action in light of the doctrine of purgatory. Okay, now if you didn't understand what he was saying there, I can, I'll can i try to break it down in another way of saying it, okay? You take your finger, you go like this, and you go, and it helps too if you turn your finger like that, like cuckoo, you know, like, you know. Okay, 
sacred inference and, and logical deduction and blah, blah, blah. They're not Bible believers. If you're a Roman Catholic, you are not a Bible-believing Christian. Don't even tell me you are. You're not. Okay? Uh, what does the Bible teach? Well, uh, we go into a big study, but we're not going to here. I have plenty of studies out there on it, over 900 videos now, so you can go through if you're really looking for truth. You can find it um, on my channel, on other ones. Uh, even check out Ex-Catholics for Christ uh, on YouTube, James and Patrick Patel. Um, they're former Catholics, so check theirs out too. But, um, you know, uh, what does the Bible teach about this thing of your sins being paid for? Well, the Bible teaches that your sins were paid for at the cross. All right. Righteousness is imputed to you. Let me show you that real quickly here in closing. And this is something that the Roman Catholic Church cannot teach you. Romans chapter 4, verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You see, when you get saved, when you get born again by, your, by faith, in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, when you get saved that way, Jesus Christ's righteousness is imputed to you. So all the sins that you do, past, present, and future, all those sins are paid for at the cross. And any suffering you do for those sins, you're going to do here on this earth. You're not going to go to some eternal state where you're going to have to suffer a bit and burn for a while and things like this until you finally make it into heaven. That's nonsense. There's no teaching on that in this King James Bible. There's none. All right. He couldn't give you one. All he could do is just refer to something in 2 Maccabees there. And, and what he was talking about in the first and second Samuel or whatever it was there, what he's talking about is just a thing of God punishing sin and whatever else. It doesn't have anything about people burning in an eternal state. All right. Some kind of a place, a holding tank where you go and you burn there for a little while and then and then you know you get out or whatever else. No, 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 no. That's not there. You won't find that in the King James Bible. So, if you're a Roman Catholic, please watch our gospel message, our salvation message. Uh, understand that uh, you're not saved. You're not a Christian. You are in a pagan cult that uh, defies the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He lied to you right in that video, telling you that Jesus never said to read the Bible. Um, well, he might not have said those exact words, but he's saying... Search the scriptures, you know, the, the words. And, I mean, he's telling you to read the word, you know. I mean, it's just, it's incredible that anybody could listen to that and come away thinking that this guy's a Christian. So, um, I also have a good video you might want to check out if you're a Roman Catholic, 13 Reasons Why Every Christian Should Reject the Mass. And what I do in it is I actually show you that even your most holy Bible, the 1582 Reims New Testament, even this one teaches against Roman Catholic teaching. See? And I'll say this too. Another thing I want to just make a point of. This thing of the, you need other things as a, as a Christian. The church. The authority of the church. There you have catechisms. Council of Trent. Vatican II. The church teaches by Jesuit fathers. You see? I'm not ignorant of Catholicism first of all. I like to make that point I have studied Catholicism for many years but secondly you need a whole bunch of other stuff besides the Bible besides a personal relationship with Jesus Christ how do you know if they're not lying to you and let me show you another thing here if I can get this thing over here this is what a real true Roman Catholic Bible looks like you see four volumes how about the a Bible believers Bible just one. You see, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, so all I need is this book. And the Holy Spirit guides me into all truth. Right there. I can judge anybody because I have a perfect standard in the Bible itself. You say, why is this thing so big? Why are there four volumes? Because it's all approved teachings in the footnotes. They can't let you just read this Bible for yourself. They have to tell you what to believe.
And you heard him say why. Christ appointed the apostles and things like this. That's kind of funny because if you actually look at the text, uh, where one of the Catholic uh, key verses that they go to, the thing where Jesus says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church. You know, A couple of verses later, Jesus rebukes Peter and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Hmm. Interesting. Catholics are not Bible-believing Christians. Please get saved if you're a Roman Catholic. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.